our Father's Word. Let's get right into it. We come to the 14th chapter in the great book of Revelation. I want you to make one note about this chapter and chapter 15. Chapter 14 is written concerning earth. Chapter 15 is written concerning heaven. So it kind of gives you an idea of what happens in both places. Right here at the end, we have had the visit by Antichrist and some overcame, some didn't, and we'll be ricocheting around a little bit and we'll keep up as we go along. So having said that, uh, in preparation uh, for that millennium period, chapter 14 addressed to earth concerning, um, again, warnings of God's wrath and what happens when it spills over. Chapter 14, verse 1, and it reads, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on, the mount, on Mount Zion. Well, of course, you know who that lamb is. That's the lamb of God. He has returned. And there he stands on Mount Zion. That's Mount Zion in the Hebrew. And with him in hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Now, the manuscripts don't say a lamb. It says the lamb, which means specific. The only lamb. The lamb of God, okay? And, um, of course, this 144,000 are those that we place the seal in their foreheads way back in chapter 7. I, I want to say a little bit about them, that as it is written in the 44th chapter of Ezekiel concerning the millennium, you have two different types of priests there. You have Levitical priests, which means priest of the law. And then you have the Zadok, the priest of the Zadok, which is God's election. Now, it is written there that the Levitical priesthood went astray when Israel did, meaning they were deceived for a long time. But when God's elect began to witness and began to testify, then uh, at that time, the 144,000 were sealed and they came out. Now, as long as a person repents in the flesh body, they are, they've got it made, okay? They, they are, so to speak, virgins, spiritually speaking, all right? So, there you have it. Now, we have another place, and I want to turn there, Hebrews chapter 12, where this same lamb went to Mount Zion, and it's kind of compared to what Moses did when he was there. Remember what happened at Mount Zion for Moses? Uh, let's read it. Chapter, 20, chapter 12, the great book of Hebrews, verse 22, we're going to read. Um, and it states there, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. And here we have the army that is with the Lamb. Not the earthly people, but the, even the army that is with the Lamb. 23, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. That's to say they're in the book of life. They overcame. And to God, the judge of all, the only judge of all and to the saints of to the rather the spirits of just men made perfect made mature just means justified judged and justified and they made it and of course naturally we're talking about God's elect here the Zadok of Ezekiel 44 verse 24 and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Abel's blood cried out from the ground for vengeance. And Christ's blood cries out for it with salvation. Salvation for you, salvation for whomsoever will call upon his name, that Lamb of God. Verse 25, See that you refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not ye we escape. That's to say Moses spake on earth, gave the law, 
They refused him. They partied even while he was up on the, uh, the, the mount. Much more shall we not uh, shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. The Holy Spirit, if you turn away from that, being one of God's elect, the just, that's unforgivable. Uh, and you've heard me say, I'm sure many times, that's not going to happen. It just is not going to happen. Verse 26, whose voice then shook the earth. This is to say there's a great shaking coming and you want to be prepared for it mentally and spiritually. But now he hath promised saying, and, and this is a promise from God, don't ever forget it. Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. I mean, there's sh uh, Satan and his little boys are going to be shaken. We're going to shake them right out of heaven. Right off onto the earth and shake the earth as well. Okay, 27. And this word, what word? God's word. This word. Yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that's to say created, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Now that says it all if you'll grasp it. If you are anchored and if your foundation is Christ, you can't be shaken. Okay. And the only things that are shaken are the elements that are negative, that are sinful, that are of Satan, that are satanic, um, it's called in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, the elements or the rudiments are in the Greek stantion. Uh, they're they're, they're going to be burned up because God is a consuming fire. They're going to be shaken real well. But what about you? That's why I came here. I want, you to, I want you to really dig in and know God isn't angry at his elect. And, and that's why I wanted you to know the difference here that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Remain where? Right here. Not flying away somewhere. Remaining right here on earth where his temple will be established as we will document in chapter 21 of, of the great book of Revelation. So, yeah, there's a great shaking going to happen. And you don't have to worry about it one iota because you're going to remain. Verse 28. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, can't be shaken. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Reverence, love, loving Him. Mercy, unmerited favor. We don't really deserve it, but we love Him. We have repented. Your name is in that book of life, right there in heaven, and you overcome. And here's one thing you want to always remember, 29, for God is a consuming fire. That fire, of course, will burn up the elements, the rudiments, that that is evil, but it warms the heart as the Holy Spirit touches and gives unction to his children, to those that are on that rock that cannot be shaken, cannot be moved. You don't have anything to worry about. Now, we're going to go through about six angels in this particular chapter. Let's go with it. Returning to the 14th chapter of the great book of Revelation written to earth. Uh, verse 2. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters uh, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping in their harps. And of course this is always symbolic of the voice of God. It thunders. 3. And they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne. It's that song written in Revelation 2, 17, uh, where a white stone was given and a new song and a new name, God's children. And before the four beasts, those four living creatures, the Zoe, or Zoom, and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the 140 and 4,000 which were redeemed from the earth. And of course... Um, at that moment they sang that song, but as it's promised, all of God's elect know that song. And as we learned in chapter 7, already in heaven, you couldn't even count the people that had died and had washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. They could sing. Okay. Verse 4. These 
are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And I have no doubt in my mind, these are you, some of your friends today that will not listen to you. But when you have told them that you will be delivered up before the Antichrist, when you are de facto delivered up before the Antichrist and the Holy Spirit speaks through you, they're going to say, wow, he or she told me this would happen. And it has. It's true. And as it is written in Luke 21, even the gainsayers will be convinced by what God's elect say at that time. And they're converted. They're redeemed from the masses. This is why it's written in Ezekiel chapter 44 concerning those Levitical priests that when Israel went astray, so did they. But they had the seal of God in their forehead, meaning they knew what was going to happen. And when it did happen, they believed. This is why you don't want to judge any of your friends that you planted seed with that you felt didn't grow. It's embedded. And when the prophecy, you see, a prophecy is not a prophecy if it isn't spoken before the fact. Verse 5. And in their mouth was found no guile. This is the loss in the Greek. It means no lies. They weren't lying. They weren't tricking anybody. It wasn't a decoy. That's what the loss means. For they are without fault before the throne of God. And instead of blowing smoke and fire and brimstone as the evil ones did, they spoke truth. The truth of God's word. Verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. This message will be taught. God's word never changes. It won't change in this age. It won't change in the age to come. And it hasn't changed in ages past. God's word is always the same. And that word is what is preached even for a thousand years through the millennium for the, the people that have never had an opportunity because of false teaching to learn the real truth. It will be taught at that time. Verse 7, this angel saying with a loud voice, fear God, I mean, revere him, love him, and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the foundations of waters. Now, you're given a date there. You're given a time and I don't want you to read over it. It's important because we're not talking about the judgment seat of Christ and we're not talking about the first resurrection. We're talking about the great white throne judgment. We're talking about God's judgment here. Well, question, when does it happen? At the end of the millennium. So this lets you know that teaching that continues on, that is preached. The word of God. Oh, never, never think you're wasting time studying the word of God because it's always going to be with us. Here we have come to the end of the millennium and the great white throne judgment where that that is evil will be done away with and, and good riddance. It will be well time that we would be rid of it. So we see here that um, God's judgment is come. That day is here. Verse 8. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen. That's confusion, babble, and nonsense. It's out of here. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Fornication in this sense, in the spiritual sense, is teaching other religions. Trying to bring other religions before people to get them to follow. It is considered fornication for idolatry replaced with idolatry, okay? And 
This is the main thing that Satan tries to do. Why? He wants people to worship him. So he comes up and misleads people into starting all kinds of religions and belief and, and traditions that make void the word of God because he wishes the preeminence. But he'll never have it. Verse 9. And the third angel followed them. Here we got three. Saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, that's the image of that one world political system, becomes a part of that one world political system headed by Satan, and receive his mark in his forehead, that is to believe upon and worship in their mind that false leadership, or in his hand, that means to help his little old church along, to do, do the work, verse 10, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. That's God's indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now, who is it talking about? You know, a lot of people get on guilt trips and they just start shaking in their boots. Oh, I want to be gone. Why? This is talking about those that follow Satan. This is talking about those that participate in his one world system and help build his church. You don't have any... God's indignation is not against you. Quite the contrary. He loves you. So you don't have anything to worry about. However, that third angel brings a message for those that are on the earth. If you should follow that one world system headed by Antichrist. If you do help it along. If you wish it Godspeed. Then you're in a heap of hurt, friend. Because that is who God is angry at. His indignation. There, there is nothing like God's indignation. What did we read in the last verse of Hebrews chapter 12? God is a consuming fire. Not a little fire when he, his indignation up that singes, but consumes, blots out, does away with. Verse 11. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name those that participate that means that at the end of the millennium and we were given that date by God's judgment okay at the end of the millennium their smoke goes up forever and ever. Why? Well, many might say, well, that means they're going to be alive. No, what did it say? It said um, that uh, God is a consuming fire. When they're consumed, they don't live forever and ever. Their smoke goes up forever and ever. There is an acrostic in the 37th Psalm hidden in the Hebrew manuscripts, which stipulates, never think that the wicked get ahead first part of it. Second part, for they shall roast over an open fire like a lamb on a, sp sp a spit. And when the fat drops into the fire, the smoke goes up forever and ever. And the third part of the acrostic is in closing that you're going to be there to see it because you're one of God's elect. You're one of God's followers. Okay, And he's not angry at you. But I assure you, all through the millennium, there's going to be a great deal of shame for those that were Christian, thought they were. And, and you know what? Well-meaning. And, and, and this really, it, it hurts me. I get no joy from knowing someone that has warmed a church pew all their life. Started out in that church as little children in Sunday school. And really tried hard to be a good Christian, but never had a teacher. Never had the truth taught there. Well-meaning. And yet they had the word of God with them all the time if they had only picked it up. 
and absorbed it for themselves instead of listening to some ratchet jaw. I'm not judging, but I am, I am very hard on people that claim to be pastors and mislead God's children. Very hard on them. And, and, and that, that doesn't amount to anything because God's a lot harder on them than that. Judgment begins at the pulpit. Verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. This is a set aside ones, God's elect. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. These are the ones we're talking about. They don't have anything to worry about. Why? They keep the commandments of God. They don't follow the one world system headed by Satan or join his church. 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. That's a very important verse. What can you take to heaven with you? It's answered right there. Your works. Well, well how can, why do I take my works? Because you're judged by them. That's your reward. That's when God judges you in that book of life. Your works are written there. I don't know. Uh, you know, you would be in pretty bad shape if it's said by your name that you worship the mark of the beast, that you worship the, the Antichrist and his system. And that's the only work. You really worked hard for Satan. That won't get you anywhere in heaven. Okay. Won't get you anywhere in the book of life other than God's indignation and a part of the abomination of desolation of the end times. It's coming, friend. Make certain you're never a part of it. But your works will go with you. And as you're going to learn in the 19th chapter, verses 7 and 8, that your works create your righteous acts that weave together the fine linen that you wear as a robe in heaven. Otherwise, you'll be naked as a jaybird made it to heaven but look at me I'm naked as a jay no works well, what are works well it can even be a smile to someone that's depressed it, it can be you know just uh, let's take many times women who are housewives they feel they never do any works and they do the hardest work in the world just waiting on a family and taking care of them giving them a good home and, and a Christian upbringing. Talk about works. Talk about rewards. Okay. But uh, rewards fall and works fall in many ways. But never forget that 13th verse of this 14th chapter of Revelation. You know, that's your reward, is your works. Okay, and verse 14 to continue. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and his, in his hand a sharp sickle. Okay? And the tares are about to get it. Okay? Again, don't forget the time. It's God's judgment. 15. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Trust in thy sickle and reap. For the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. This is fair judgment. Okay. Now, you might think about this. Do you know what a sickle is? A sickle is for harvest, all right. That's what you bring in the wheat, usually. Okay. The bundles. You take a sickle and, and, and um, hand you bundles and tie them uh, with a string of, of the wheat and shock them. That is to say, put them, put them in a shock where the rain can't damage them. Verse 16, And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. In other words, the word thrust here means he cast it. You don't want to really get in the way of this sickle. You know why? 17, And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, 
he also having a sharp sickle. And that's to be the fifth angel. Did these angels have to do with bringing the seals to pass in actuality, reminding us after the fact, kind of? Do you know why? Because this next one is the sixth angel, 18. And another angel, this is the sixth, came out from the altar which had power over fire. And cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. Now this lets you, that are familiar with agriculture, know what's going on. Now clusters are grapes. Have you ever in all your life ever heard of anybody harvesting grapes with a sickle? Of course not. You don't harvest grapes with a sickle. You gather and clip the little bunches where they go to the vat or whatever you intend to use the grapes for. But if you use a sharp sickle and you whack into them, the blood of that grape is going to splatter and go everywhere. That's not the way it's done, but it shows you the indignation of Almighty God that those people that He created that have fallen a, a, astray, He really doesn't have that much mercy on them in plucking them and bringing them to the harvest. It's going to get their attention. I mean, that's destruction. God is a consuming fire. This angel had the power of fire. 19. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And there it is. The wine press of the wrath of God is a fiery pit, okay, an abyss of a pit, a lake of fire in a sense. Now, in the next chapter, listen to me carefully here. I'm going to get it. We're going to. I'm going to give you a little peek of the next lecture, but it's something I want you to make a mental note of, so it'll be fresh in your mind when we come to that point. And this will make a lot more sense to you. In the next verse, chapter rather, that is written to heaven, you're going to be introduced to the Song of Moses. And the Song of Moses is a song that you must be familiar with. You must have a working knowledge of the Song of Moses. Why? Because that's the song that people sing that overcome the mark of the beast, the one world political system. Why? Because the Song of Moses gives you the knowledge to overcome it. But in that Psalm, in that Song of Moses, it tells you concerning the Kenite, their vine is not our vine. Or their grape is not our grape. These grapes that are harvested with that sickle are not ours. Okay. They're the enemies of God. And that will be fresh in your mind when we come to the next chapter and it will be in the next lecture and um, I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. Listen, the great wine press of the wrath of God, he is a consuming fire and Father has waited a long time. You know, this cup, this cup of indignation back in verse 10, this is the cup that Jesus said, Father, is there some other way we can do this without pouring that cup out on the people? In other words, is there a gentler way? And not my will but yours, Father. Father would not grant it. He intends to pour that cup of indignation. You know something? He is ever so patient. He has waited all these years as his people have been missed abused, mistreated, used, and he has had to sit back or has sit back and allowed Satan to have free run 
for people whosoever will allow Satan to do whatever he will even though God himself gave power to his children to overcome Satan and they won't use it so he's waited a long time to crank up this pit this great wine press you know uh, you might picture what, what he wants you to picture what his wine press is like have you ever seen anybody stomp grapes? Hmm? Have you ever seen a wine press? Throw those ripe grapes in there, and I mean the juice flies. They are crushed into nothingness. Okay? Now, um, and if it were anything but the white throne judgment, you might say, well, the juice itself through fermentation will purify itself only this is bad and it is the great wine press of God's wrath and the harvest or the people who have disobeyed God verse 20 to complete the chapter and the wine press was trodden without the city and blood came out of the wine press even to the horses bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. That's two hundred miles. I mean two hundred miles she ran. Uh, that kind of uh, lets you see how many people are involved in God's judgment. It's not going to be a, a pretty wine press. Okay. But it is when, when it is final then what God is doing is literally blotting out of our minds as well those that didn't make it on God's white throne judgment. For what follows the white throne judgment is the second death, which means the death of the soul. Now, we come to the 15th chapter, which is, addresses heaven and what's happening in heaven. You need to know that. And you need to know that song I mentioned because that's, that's the song overcomers sing. And you need to know the words, not memorize necessarily, but the working order of them. So see you don't miss that next lecture. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please?